Hey, welcome back to the evening session of Return. Uh, this afternoon was a great time with Charles Cooper, and I hope you got all your answers uh, that you were looking for about the rapture and the timing of the rapture. Just so interesting. And we're going to have more of that tonight. But before we do that, we want to invite you once again that on this day three, we're going to start off this session with worship. And so once again, engage your hearts. Get ready yourself and, and focus on just pressing into the presence of the Lord. And today, here to lead us in worship, we have none other than Justin Rizzo and his beautiful wife who are going to lead us in this time of worship. So once again, isolate any distractions in the room, focus your heart on the Lord, and press into His presence with your worship. So Lord, thank you so much for your spirit. Us as we worship together in this room, your spirit would just come in a greater measure as we exalt you, as we lift you high. So you are the holy, you are the worthy, you are the beautiful God. Jesus, we love you. We love you, Lord. You are holy, King Almighty, on your throne. Over all things, God, you reign, you stand alone. Nothing hinder your presence in this place take us deeper lord we're here to bring you praise we worship and adore you creation bows before are our Savior, and you are our friend. And Lord, we stand in wonder, in awe of your compassion, for no other love could you are worthy king of all you came for us I'm giving your life giving your life on the cross you've shown your love oh nothing hinder nothing hinder your presence in this place take us deeper Lord we're here to bring you praise we worship and adore you creation bows before Savior, you are our Savior, and you are our friend. Lord, we stand, Lord, we stand in wonder, in awe of your compassion. Lord, 
in all my obedience cannot convey the way that I'm feeling here in light of your grace. Well, you paid it all, Lord, you paid it all for me. Hallelujah, oh, I raise up my hands to the Savior, whose blood does command all my worship, I worship. Hallelujah, I fall, I fall at the feet of the Savior, who suffered for me and I worship, I worship. Cause my heart to believe All you've accomplished for me Thank you for all that you've done God, if I had to bring payment If I had to bring payment For all the error of my ways For all of the error of my ways I'd live and die I'd live and not die in those chains Thank you for all that you've done
One thing I ask of you, one thing I desire To gaze upon you, Lord, all the days of my life Oh, to be a door, a keeper in the temple of my Lord One thing I desire, one thing I desire Oh, a pilgrim here, waiting for your return Oh, my Jesus, one thing I desire That one thing I'll see to gaze on the beauty of the Lord all the days of my life. Oh, one thing I desire. One thing I desire. Your glory will cover the earth like the waters cover the seas, and the earth will sing your praises. Forevermore, the kingdom shall be. I will tell of your mercy and your unfailing love. I will be to the glory of your name. Like a better day will see you Lifted high above They will speak Of the one upon the throne And your glory, Jesus Will cover the earth Like the water Forever united 
king, you're the king that we want, Jesus. You're the king, you're the king that we want, come Lord Jesus. Oh, 
Jesus Sometimes I feel So weak It's like the air That I breathe Is laden With sorrow heart it is set on this pilgrimage and my strength comes from you For the weak ones who keep pressing on You are not unjust to forget Their choice by choice Their yes by yes Their day by day And their step by step for the weak ones who keep pressing on You are not unjust to forget Their choice by choice Their yes by yes Their day by day And their step by Jesus, you are not unjust to forget. So again today, I give you my weak yes. You see every yes and every step I take. Even when it is filled with weakness, Till I say yes again Still I say yes again, Lord Still I say yes again to you, Lord So we just give you our lives afresh right now in this moment We give you our love afresh, Lord We cannot deny it. But you are good and you are always good. We cannot deny it. Jesus, you are coming again to reign and to rule upon the earth. But we say there's one king that we want. But this is why we sacrifice our lives here. We give you everything, Lord, as pilgrims in this age. Because we cannot deny it, Lord. You are beautiful beyond description. The, uh, the weightiness of the Spirit during that time it was powerful, that we would give our lives to the Lord, especially in the days that we're living, to a greater degree. We have to be aware of it, and we find our worship uh, being the vehicle by which we're able to express our heart in that way. Thank you, Justin. That was a powerful time, Naomi. Just thank you so much for giving of yourselves for our conference. Absolutely. So we're gonna move to our speaker right now, Charles Cooper is with us this afternoon. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you were part of that. And the, the, the questions and the answers were just a great time to be together. Charles has been an awesome friend to me personally, a mentor in the subject, uh, uh, the book Revelation and the End Times. And now just get ready for just a powerful message. He, he wrote a book on this subject, How to Survive the Great Tribulation. It's not what you think. So uh, enjoy uh, this time together. Get ready, get yourselves situated and uh, ready to uh, feast on the Word of God. Let's watch it. 
Hello and welcome to my session in this uh, conference. I've been asked to talk about perhaps what is the most probative question of our time, particularly, I suppose, if you are pre-wrath new to it, and that question ultimately revolves around the Great Tribulation, how to survive the Great Tribulation. I suppose that if one has settled in his own or her, his or her own mind the question of timing regarding the, the ethereal reunion of God's people, with the Lord Jesus, he promised that he would meet us in the air and there transformation would occur. Supposedly, um, as we understand it, this event is going to occur sometime during the second half of Daniel's final week. That then does put the question at front and center, uh, how can we survive this uh, unparalleled time of persecution? Is it possible? And if so, what are the exact particulars? I want you to know that this question, while is, uh, it is important, it is not the most important question. It is not the most probative uh, design that you need to be focused on. I believe that there are other questions which are, are more important for your day-to-day -day existence. Primarily, that is, how or whether or not you understand that every day, every hour, and every minute of the day, you are being asked, whether verbally or not, whether Christ is your authority or culture is your authority. The past year has demonstrated the power and the absolute dogmatic, unrelenting uh, commitment of culture to shape our lives. They want to tell us who we can marry, who we, uh, who we can um, what bathroom we could use. They want to tell us what uh, historical figure we can honor. Uh, culture has come uh, about in a, more, in a powerful way in the last year in terms of its demand that we have to acquiesce and follow its dictates. You need to know that that is a question really of lordship, whether Christ is your Lord or whether culture is your Lord. That is a question every day that you're being forced to deal with. There's another question and it has to do with whether the word or the world is in charge of your conduct. Are you following God's word, the dictates of his word concerning what you think, say, and do? Or are you under the auspices of the world? This is an important question put to you every day, whether verbally or not, it is, in fact, the determinant in how you behave. And then lastly, there is the question of whether you are kingdom versus country focused in your ultimate devotion. Many people in this country, unfortunately, have so intertwined, so uh, merged country and faith to the point that they believe to be patriotic is to be both Christian and a devotee of our country. Now, I'm most certainly, I'm proud to be an American, love the country and will, willing to do whatever I can to sustain her and to keep her around. But at the end of the day, the ultimate uh, devotion of my heart is to the kingdom of God. And God's kingdom demands that we act, it demands that we talk, it demands that we behave in a far more distinctive way than what the world is willing to convey. Now, these questions, I believe, shape how we then will answer the question about how we survive the Great Tribulation. In terms of uh, the pre-wrath view, which I'm assuming that most of you who are looking, uh, watching today or joining this conference uh, have uh, some openness to the position. Our timeline suggests that the final week of Daniel is the time frame in which most of these events will occur. We believe that we will then be challenged uh, by the sequence of events that uh, are laid out in God's word. It's my conviction that the book of Revelation details the exact chronology of this period starting in chapter 6. We are going to go through the first half of Daniel's week, three and a half years, 42 months, 1,260 days. At some point, uh, about the middle, uh, at the middle, we, we are told that there's going to be a conflagration of events that will result in the most intense persecution committed followers of Christ will ever know. We call it the midpoint from that point to the end of the final week 
Satan will unleash on those who refuse to submit to his uh, demands, uh, hellacious uh, tribulation, persecution, the Bible says it will be unparalleled in its focus. That will eventuate into God's wrath, the most intense, unexperienced expression of God's wrath this world will ever know. You have two periods now that are unparalleled in their focus. The wrath of Satan first, the wrath of God second. It culminates with the bold judgment, uh, just uh, concluding the uh, battle uh, at uh, Har Moed, the uh, place of meeting. Uh, and then, of course, we go into the millennial kingdom, the reign of Christ on this earth. This, of course, forces us to wrestle with the question of what would be our attitude should our generation, should you be alive on the earth when these events inaugurate? What then, how then should you behave yourself and what should be your goal in terms of what you do, what you say, and what you think? I want you to know in Matthew chapter 25, verses 15 to 28, Jesus sets forth very clearly the outline of this three and a half year period that will be shortened by the grace and mercy of God. The Lord Jesus says to us, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Uh, Mark says you flee to the wilderness, uh, that wherever you go, wherever you should uh, uh, run to, will primarily uh, be a place of divine protection or divine sanction. You've been to Israel, as I have, you know that there is no mountain sufficient to hide anybody in uh, within, uh, you know, four or five hundred miles of um of Jerusalem. And yet uh, the Lord says, if you flee uh, to these areas, the assumption is that you will be safe uh, once you get there. So I'm going to say it up front and forcefully that if your desire is to survive this unparalleled season of physical persecution by the evil one, you probably would want to go to Israel and when it says flee, you should run with whoever is running and follow them because this is going to be a divine place of protection by the power and might of God. I do not have any conviction whatsoever that there will be any other place on this earth that will be safe from this evil, wicked person other than this region that God will supernaturally provide protection for his people. So if this is something that is paramount and of importance to you, then this is my recommendation to you. Now, Jesus continues by saying, let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in the house and let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. Alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. In other words, when the the word goes out, when the signal goes out, when it is when it is stated that something unparalleled has happened in the worship site of God, you need to run and you need to run immediately. You do not go back. Uh, you pass, uh, go, uh, you pass, go, and you go as fast as you uh, can. There will be no need for anything to take with you. Your, your focus should not be on the things of this world, but on moving from Jerusalem, where the epicenter of this event will be. I believe that this is a signal to us as well, that uh, we need to uh, be sober as we think about these things. It is not normally to the extreme nature that we tend to think things will be. The Lord continues, for then there will be great tribulations such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be Say, for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. So here we have a promise in the scripture from the Lord himself 
that this period is going to be uh, limited in its duration and that it consequently will not achieve its ultimate goal, which I believe, of course, um, is to um, kill or, or remove as many believers um, as practicable. Uh, Jesus is telling us that we need not fear that he is still in control and that even though this unparalleled period of persecution that the world will ever know, uh, he will still be in control and he will uh, determine who does and who does not die based on his uh, particular plan. He concludes, then if anyone says to you, look here, here's the Christ or there he is, do not believe it for false prophets and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders. Now, these are not fake signs. Understand, he is not saying that these guys are pulling off a giant smoke screen, that they are somehow uh, shucking and jiving, just smoking mirrors. These are real, legitimate, authentic signs that you will see, but you are not to be deceived by them, Jesus says. He says, you are not to be led astray even though they are going to be authentic and real enough to fool the elect, if it were in fact possible. See, I have told you beforehand, therefore, not only should you not be fooled by them because they are not proving the truthfulness of the claim, uh, and secondly, because I've told you they're going to do it, Jesus says, therefore, you should not be fooled. So if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness, or do not do not go out. If they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Whoever the, wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. In other words, Jesus is saying his return will be so evident. It will be universally recognized that you will need no one to tell you. And if people are telling you that there is, um, Christ has come and is somewhere in a place that you do not know. He says you should not believe it because it is not authentic. It is not real. This is not the way it's going to occur. His will be universally, that is, it will have a cosmic, national, international flavor to it, and no one will need to tell you about what is going on. Now, Revelation chapter uh, 6, verse 9 through 11 adds to our understanding. The Lord says, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had maintained, or in this case, had borne. Now, the, the, this seal, um, the fifth seal, is critical because I think it sets a principle that I want you to be aware of. I do not want you thinking that survival is your ultimate goal. I, now, I wrote a book on how to survive the great tribulation, fight faith, uh, flight faith, or uh, uh, got my own title uh, and that's something um you know fight flight or faith excuse me uh that focuses focused on whether you should um seek to uh, try to uh, survive to see uh, the descent of the Lord of the Lord Christ from heaven. Um, I wrote a book, um, Fight, Flight, or Faith, uh, in which I tried to argue that uh, if one ultimately wants to um, be successful, that he should stand in faith and allow. Uh, the will of God to be done. The fifth seal, I think, confirms my view and supports my conclusion that really the question is not how do you survive? The question is, will you do the will of God? And the reason I believe that is 
a better way to frame the question is because of this, what we learn in this fifth seal. Uh, when he opens the fifth seal, he sees under the altar souls of those who had been slain for the word of God. These are martyrs. Um, and for the witness they had borne, they consistently and refused uh, to say anything other than Jesus is Lord. And so for that, uh, these people have suffered the ultimate um, tribulation, uh, death uh, for the Lord Jesus. Now it continues, he says, they cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Now, those who are responsible for the, the death of these individuals are earth dwellers. The people who dwell on the earth, this phrase is used um, eight times, seven uniquely in the book of Revelation, and they always describe people who are hostile or violent against God, those who seek to put off God's uh, powerful control or dominion of their lives. Now, these people at this point have yet to experience that judgment of God. They are still in control, thus uh, these people were put to death. When God takes control, uh, they're going to have little room to maneuver uh, to be engaging in these kinds of hostile actions. He says, then they uh, were each given a white robe, which is a, a sign that these are overcomers. Now, they were put to death. They are martyrs. These are not Christians in general. These are believers who were martyred, put to death, killed in various ways for their fellowship of Jesus Christ. And because of that, they earned the right and will reign with Christ, that is exercise authority and the white robe is actually a symbol of that. They were given white robes and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and other brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. Now, the, the reason this is so important to me, and I want to communicate it to you, is that God has sovereignly determined that a number of believers will die. He knows the exact number of them. And when these individuals are calling for justice, they are told that their justice which is the punishment of the earth dwellers responsible for their death, will not occur until the number is fulfilled of those God has ordained will die at the hands of these murderous thugs. This is why I'm saying to you, I do not believe that your ultimate first concern should be whether you're going to survive or not. It should be whether you're going to do the will of God, because God's will for you may be that you die. You may be counted in this number. In fact, I would say you want to be. Now, I know most of us don't, we, we, we shudder at the thought of dying, uh, because we're so into this world that leaving it is last thing on our minds. But as I was planning this lesson and as I was looking at the text and I was looking at scripture, it just suddenly dawned on me that survival is not our goal. Our goal should be to do the will of God and whatever that eventuates into, it's, let it be the will of God. This requires a maturity on our part and a depth of understanding and faith that many people simply do not 
have. This is this accords with a, a fact that I want to give you today that you may have never heard. It's probably new to your ears, uh, but it is in fact true as I believe it. How to survive the Great Tribulation, ladies and gentlemen, is a Western mindset. This this is the thinking of us in the West who have gotten so comfortable in this world and we're so um, wrapped up, quote unquote, in the things of this world that we don't think about the reality of what living for Christ can potentially mean. It's not what we think. We've been lulled to sleep because of the beautifulness of the American way of life. But it is contrary, ladies and gentlemen, to the mindset that I believe we sh should have. I think your ultimate question should be how to be an overcomer. Because that is the singular person who will find the total, complete, unambiguous satisfaction of God when the end times come. The chance that you will face the persecution of Antichrist in the end times is remote, very remote. It might, but 99.9% .9 is not going to happen. Your question, however, will meet you past the grave. You become an overcomer. That is a biblical mindset. That's a person who has set their minds on the things of God and not of this world, including my physical comfort. And we're looking to see if we can be what God has called us to be. The Apostle Paul is very interesting to me because he echoes in a way what John uh, seems to write in the Revelation chapter 2, verse 16 through uh, 26 through 29. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. Now, I don't have time today, but if you go to my YouTube channel, you, you're going to find that there is this false notion that every believer is an overcomer. The reason for that is because in the epistle of John, he says we have overcome the world. And we overcame it by the word of our faith. But in the epistle of John, an overcomer is one who believes and is saved. In other words, it's salvation. Every believer is an overcomer in the uh, arena of salvation, that he received the forgiveness of God and uh, he has become a, a participant in the kingdom of God. But not every believer is an overcomer in sanctification and this passage is talking about sanctification, not salvation. Every believer is an overcomer in salvation. Whether you're going to be an overcomer in sanctification, that question is yet to be determined. And this passage in Revelation chapter 2, verse 26 to 29, is focusing on sanctification because it's conditional. True salvation is not conditional. There are no conditions. This has very clear conditions. He says to the one who conquers and who keeps my word until the end. Now, unless you believe salvation is not an eternal proposition, and there are lots of people who do, um, this passage is, cannot be made to say that they simply lost their salvation you keep it to the end. To him I will give authority over the nations and he will rule them with the rod of iron as when earthen vet pots are broken in pieces even as myself have received authority from my father and I will give him the morning star. 
he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, the right to rule with Christ, the right to sit on his throne, the right to sit beside him in, in sovereign dominion and authority, ladies and gentlemen, is a result of your having overcome. Now, I know that there is the prevailing view among many that every believer is going to reign and every believer is going to sit on the throne and every believer is going to exercise dominion authority. I don't believe that. Matter of fact, I know it's not true. That is an over glamour, glamorized, romanticized view of the Christian life. And it's simply not true. But the Jews came from Antioch. This is Acts chapter 14, verse 19 to 22. The apostle Paul is uh, writing here. Uh, Brother Luke, of course, is recording what happened with Paul. The Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowd, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up, entered into the city, and on the next day went on with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples. Now, this is a, a peculiar passage that used to cause me no small um, concern because I didn't understand it. Now I do. Strengthening them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. That last part of this uh, verse 22 is what is rather strange and entering. And saying that through many tribulations. The, the word tribulation through lipsis is the word consistently used throughout the New Testament for tribulation. In fact, it is the word in Matthew chapter 24. It is also used in the Revelation to speak of the great tribulation. Paul says that through many polus, many tribulations, um, not a few, not a couple, not one, but in fact, many tribulations. He says, we must, and the word, the Greek word here is, is the same word used to describe the necessity of the death of Christ. He must die. It was decreed by God that he die. And in order to fulfill the decree of God, he had to die. So Paul says, it is decreed that through many uh, tribulations, there's no way around this, ladies and gentlemen. There is no escape hatch. Now, what is he saying? He says, that through many tribulation, we must enter the kingdom of God. Now, the word enter is very interesting. Um, we, we typically think of it as local. Whenever we read it in the Bible, particularly in this context, we think of it in, in the local sense. Now, what do I mean by that? We think of it in terms of entering physically from A to B. You, you enter the house, meaning you went from the outside to the inside. Or you um, enter a country. You come into physically uh, into that country. And so we, when we read this, we typically associate it with the local, that is the physical entrance into a place. But that is not how this word is being used here. And we use it in the right sense in other contexts, the nuance of this word actually is to enter or participate. For example, um, if you're going to enter a contest to win $5,000, 
you, you, there are certain things you do to enter, but you don't physically get in it. You, you don't go, you don't climb in the uh, barrel that they're going to spin out of which it will be drawn. What you usually do is you put your name and address on a piece of paper and they put it in the drum, they spin the drum and then they reach in and they pull one out and whoever they pull out wins the prize. Everybody entered, but only one person won. So when we say enter a contest, everybody knows what we mean by that. And the word enter, that's how it's being used here. When he says through many tribulation, we enter the kingdom of God. That is we participate. Now he says in order for us to participate in the kingdom, we must travel through many tribulations. Now, the reason I know this is true is because the kingdom of God cannot be equal to salvation. Because here he says, you've got to go through many tribulations to enter into it. That, that can't be salvation. Salvation is by grace through faith alone. Salvation is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Salvation is to be born of the water and of the spirit. He is not saying that there are conditions in order for you to be saved. You simply believe and you are saved. But to participate in God's kingdom. Now, the next thing I need you to understand is what the word kingdom means. The kingdom of God is not a physical place. In fact, Jesus told his disciples, listen, if it's not going to come with bells and whistles in the sky. He says, no, it's already among you. The kingdom of God is not a place. It's a, um, it's a, a reign. It's a, it's an authority. In fact, you go to my website, you'll see that the kingdom is sovereign administration because it's always focusing on the rule of God, God's actual physical ruling. So the kingdom of God is the sovereign administration of God. It's when God will physically come to this earth and rule on this earth. And he says that if you want to participate in the sovereign administration of God, you will have to earn it. It's not free. You don't get it just because you are nice. You get it because you earn it. And to earn it will involve enduring much persecution. The apostle Paul, very interestingly, says that this is the mandate of our hearts to participate in the sovereign administration of God ought to be the ultimate goal of your life. And that's why I decided to focus on this today, because I know that we all think about dying and we don't want to die and we don't like to suffer. And, you know, most of us are just begging God that if we're going to die, let us just go lay down and go to sleep and just not wake up because that's the least painful, uh, least sexy way to do it. But in reality, ladies and gentlemen, our mind should not be on how to survive. It should be on how to be obedient to whatever God wants for us. What is he calling us to? What has he ordained as a reality in my life? That is the question that we must ask. I, I'm, I'm just struck that people would think that they are going to sit on a throne and rule beside the apostle Paul. Um, there are a lot of people that I want to meet when I get to heaven, but the apostle Paul is a guy who he put his money where his mouth is. Let me tell you. Um, he writes in, in second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 21. He says to my shame, I must say we were too weak for that, but whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I, I'm speaking of the fool. I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. And now I'm talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonment, countless beatings, 
Often near death, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. I was once stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers and dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers in toils and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold exposure, and apart from all these things, there's the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches I planted and that I hope will do very, very well. Let me ask you a question. How do you think you stack up against the Apostle Paul, who himself worried that he might have missed the boat? Paul said, you know, at least what, what bothers me is that though I've taught others, I myself might be shipwrecked. I myself, I box my body, he says. I give myself a black eye that, so that I won't have taught others about what they should do, and yet I myself fail to make it. Now, what's he talking about? Well, he's talking about whether or not he earns the right to participate in the sovereign administration of the kingdom of God, not to be in it, but to administrate it. Ladies and gentlemen, I am so concerned for the body of Christ right now because I believe that we have been, wow, we've been focused on the wrong thing. And I wanna to say to you that being at this conference is important for you if for no other reason than you get it, you understand the goal of your life is to be found faithful, an overcomer. You held out to the end. You didn't give up. You were not lazy. But you fought a good fight and you finished your course. There are three objectives, I believe, to your life. You want to hear the Lord say, well done. That verbal praise, I believe that you will get a verbal praise that everybody will hear when he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. You need to know that not all believers are going to hear that. Not only will you get a verbal praise, but you also are going to get exaltation. He says, if you were faithful over a few, I'll make you ruler over many. He says that if you were faithful with the five, I'll give you five more. Exaltation, you will be raised up because of your faithfulness and given more prominence because of your faithful. See, it doesn't matter what you were given in this world, the reward for it is participation in the sovereign administration of God. And then thirdly, you will be seated with Christ on his throne. But what I need you to remember and understand, ladies and gentlemen, it's not free. Thulipsis, tribulation, marks the road of those who will reign. The most probative question that you're being asked today is not how you will survive the Great Tribulation. It's, are you faithful? Can you see any tribulation in your life? Has there ever been any? I think we Americans have probably miscalculated terribly. And I don't want that for you. Father, I pray for your people. I pray for all of us because 
I feel, Father, that we bought a pig in a poke. That we were so interested in winning that we misunderstood what the prize is. Help us reveal to us, open our minds to the soberness of our present reality. To where you're going and how you're planning to get us there. In Jesus' name. Whew. And I hope you were taking notes. <laughs> There's just a lot there. And I'm sure that we were all just being stretched and challenged as we think through these topics of the end times. And we're just really grateful for Charles Cooper and his contribution tonight to bringing us um, this message in such a timely way. And so we want to remind you that we will continue tomorrow for day four. And uh, it's not over yet. But tomorrow afternoon at 2 p.m., we will be meeting with Joel Richardson. Wow. And so you don't want to miss that. That's at 2 p.m. on our social media platforms. We're going to be going live. And that means you get to be a part of that discussion as well. So join us tomorrow at 2 p.m. Bring your questions, bring all of your comments, share, interact with us, engage with us as we meet and, and sit and discuss Joel Richardson, uh, with Joel Richardson, the topics of the end times. See you tomorrow too. Good morning.